friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. We've got a, a nice project in here today. Definitely got a work cut out for us. You've seen these before. It's a Gibson A style mandolin. Now, I looked in here and I don't see a specific model number. I don't see a specific serial number. I've looked on the back of the peg head. I've looked all over. I just don't see any numbers in it anywhere. Even took my little camera, went inside it, and looked around. You know, on first glance, you think, well, that's a pretty nice old mandolin. But, boy, it's, it's got some issues. Uh, you can see along here how it's just wore off really bad. The frets are sticking up really high in that area. The tuner buttons have disintegrated to the point of really not being even usable anymore. This one's even broken half. It's just got a lot of issues like that. A lot of stories it could tell you know all the different things that you see on the front here and in fact some of the stories that it will tell are right here if you look there it the name on the back of this photo says jack rice in the 1950s with band singer he worked with don't know the band singer's name there but uh Jack Rice is what apparently that fellow's name was, holding the mandolin there. And you can see he's got it electrified. If you can get up close there where you can see it. And uh, it looks like there's uh, electronics on there, which probably accounts for the different scarring and things on the front there. Apparently, this is uh, him again in a different photo. It says, this is Jack Rice when he first got this Gibson mandolin. Don't know the date, but somewhere in the early 1950s, it says. So, it's kind of nice to get uh, some of the information with the mandolin when you get it like that. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to show you that, uh, you know, we've seen this before, but Gibson is not incredibly particular about spreading glue around on the inside of a mandolin. So let's take a look down inside here. I'm going to show you that I'm going to be going inside the mandolin you'll be able to tell that uh, when we get in there there's just glue everywhere let's look let's go this way first we'll look at this brace here the glue is just poured in there everywhere around that brace now you know could someone else have done that I think so but I don't think someone else did all of this glue if you look around on the side here um, there's just glue everywhere it's uh, let me see get up here where I can see it a little better yeah, this is all just glue that's just run out inside the instrument here. You can just see it here, I think. But anyway, it's it's just very sloppily done. I mean, the glue is just poured out inside the thing. You know, we can't fix all of that, I don't think. But we can uh, do our best on this old mandolin to bring it back up into good playing condition. We definitely have our work cut out for us, and we'll see what we can do with it. When I opened the case on this mandolin originally, it, it's been sitting in here a week or so. I just made notes to myself. Some of the notes here say hairline crack, back of peg head. So if we look here, you can see this. It's very hard to see, actually. But there's a little hairline crack here, and it wraps around, goes back up in here somewhere. There you can. You can kind of see that. So there's a hairline crack there. I'm not sure how bad that is. Okay, the fretboard itself is in really bad shape. Um, there's, it, It's just dished out between the frets and everything. The fretboard apparently is not ebony. I can't really tell what it is for sure. You know, I want to say it's rosewood, and it probably is. The tailpiece cover is missing back here, so that's missing. I, Based on what I can see, it looks like the original tailpiece, but I won't even swear to that. But it does look like it, because I don't see any markings or anything. The bridge feet themselves don't match up to the top at all. You can see a lot of light. In the middle, you can always see it, but you can see it under here, too, I think. So it's not very good at all. And if you were concerned about originality of the mandolin, which that doesn't matter to me too much, but if the customer wanted it to be totally original, then we'd have to find a pick guard where it used to attach here and along here in the neck. I think you can see the hole there. So there used to be a pick guard on it. There's no pick guard. 
I'm noticing two holes drilled here just now in the camera. I didn't even notice that before, but apparently that's where they must have mounted the pickup or something. Nothing like the present to just dig in and let's get started. <laughs> I did have a conversation with the customer about the mandolin and we've uh, opted to go with new tuners. Uh, I think that's the best way to go in this case. You know, you can put buttons on here and uh, they might work and then they might not hold. You know, they might slip or something. So, you know, it's it's kind of a 50-50 gamble on that. That might work just fine and, and you'd have no further problem, but then again, it might not. So he, he really wants it up in playable condition. He's not too concerned about the originality of it. You know, he knows that it's not worth a ton of money, especially in the kind of condition it's in. You can see there's a lot of, lot of heavy duty wear on this thing. That, that's not just finished gone. There's actually wood <laughs> wore off of there. It's been used a lot. So, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is, it's, but I think it's going to be a pretty decent mandolin when we get her back together, too. Ordinarily, I would try to wet the fretboard down real good before I start pulling frets. This one is so badly worn, I'm not sure that it would save me anything. I'm going to just see how they pull just by... These frets are also filed way down, by the way. I can barely even get a... I can't even get a grip on them. They... Uh, so they're past filing, so it has to be a replacement job. And I'm just trying to get a hold of it here with my little nippers and see if I can pull them out. Looks like it's coming out okay. Let's see if I can get you down here where you can see what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get the nippers flat on the fretboard. That keeps the tear out. This flakes of stuff, that's just dirt literally grime from the years <laughs> that I don't think there's much tear out there but we're just going to see what we can do these these frets are really filed down thin there's nothing really to grip on when I when I grip them they the metal just kind of rips up they're really in bad shape <laughs> probably the worst I've ever seen I guess in terms of just the fret themselves Officially, these really are the worst frets I've ever seen. <laughs> when you pull them out of there, they're just like one little straight wire. There's no top to them at all. They've been filed down that much. It's unbelievable. My little pliers here, it just bends them all to pieces as it's pulling them out of there. <laughs> There's nothing to grip. You just have to grip the, the flat part of the tang. The tang is all that's left. You know, that, that fret came out in pieces. I've never had that happen before. It was filed so much. <laughs> I have never seen that before. <laughs> came out in four pieces. It's, it's filed so thin, there's, there's literally nothing left at the top. Wow. When you think you've seen it all... Well, you just haven't. That's all there is to it. You just haven't seen it all yet. <laughs> this one came out in pieces as well. I thought these up here would come out better because it looked like there was more left of them, but <laughs> apparently not. Now that we've got all the frets out of here, I've got a hard piece of wood here, a very hard piece, and I've carefully sanded it perfectly flat on my belt sander. I've got a piece of sandpaper wrapped around here. This is 220. It may be good enough. It may have to go with something stronger because this is pretty bad. But we're going to go with the 220 right now and we're just going to level this out. I've been criticized for not using a neck support. I think if you're pushing hard enough that you can break something, you, uh, you know, you're doing it wrong. So I don't push very hard. Um, I don't need a neck support. I prefer not having a neck support. I like the deep carpet here. It holds it good. I like to be able to move it in different positions. I'm much faster that way. It's my preference of the way I work. Um, if you need a neck support, I don't have any problem with that either. But I don't feel I need one. I've been doing it the same way for 35 years and it works just fine for me. This is pretty dusty. I'm going to put a dust mask on.
I've got it just about as good as I think I can go with it. You can still see there's a few little finger grooves still left in there. Not very bad. You can see where it's actually broke through the hole here uh, where, there, where that pick guard used to attach. So I think I'm going to quit right there. We'll fill that hole and it'll make it look good. It's not going to look bad. But it's just that I think that's as deep as we can go. Now we will have to cut the fret slots deeper because it's just, they're not deep enough now for a fret. You know, the fretboard itself is uh, still got some life left in it. Though it's, I'd be honest, it's, we're right on the edge of just replacing the fretboard, to be honest. But I think because we didn't, you know, these, these inlays are very shallow. They're only about 30 or 40 thousandths thick, maybe 50 thousandths thick. And we didn't sand through any of those. So I say because of that, let's just go ahead and go with it and leave the fretboard as is. That'll save the customer some time, which is money. We'll just go ahead and recut the slots and make those slots a little deeper. I'm just using this little block of wood to help me keep square, you know, keep the saw square so I'm not wiggling it back and forth like this. It's of very little importance otherwise. And I'm li literally just going to be checking by eye to see if I think I'm deep enough. Well, I think you can maybe see the depth that I had to cut the frets there. I didn't cut them all the way through the fretboard or anything, but I have to admit the fretboard is getting kind of thin. I don't think it's going to be an issue. I don't, you know, I don't really think it needs to be replaced yet, but it's right on the edge. Now, there, the other problem with this is that this side is really badly worn right through here, and I don't know how to best to show you that but it's really rounded off and chipped out and everything through here. So, you know, there's almost no finish left on this thing anyway. I'm not too worried about it. I think I'm going to just try to clean this up a little bit because, you know, it would look better if it's fairly straight rather than all these curves in it and crooks in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of slightly, slightly taper it a little bit. It'll just look better and probably feel better to your hand and play better. I'm just, wherever it's really high right there is what I'm working on. There's a real deep spot right here real deep right at the fifth fret we're not going to get that all out and it's a little bit deep right in here too but that's already better there's still quite a quite a gouge right here i don't know if the person had a ring was wearing a ring that would be my guess wearing a wedding ring and it wore it out right there that's that's what my guess is we'll have to look at the picture and see if we can see a ring but it's definitely wore it out there big time I'm not going to try to get all of that out, just some of it. That's quite a bit better. It doesn't just dip down there now. It's quite a bit better. You can feel it still, but it's, it's barely there compared to the way it was. Once we clean this up and oil this back up and everything, it, you won't hardly even notice we did anything. It ain't perfect, and it ain't ever going to be perfect. <laughs> You know, the finish is completely gone here, here, and then there's a stripe of finish that goes all the way right here. <laughs> so I think I'm just going to leave it that way, and we'll just oil it up, and I think it'll blend in just fine. I'm going to look at this crack now, or even before I look at the crack, I think I'll just go ahead and take the tuning keys off, because that might open, let the crack open up a little better. Now I'm going to just see if I can open this crack up by torquing this a little bit. I don't think I can. I think it's pretty solid. I don't see a movement there. I can, I can feel it with a fingernail a little bit. 
but it's not much if we can get anything in that or not. It's a very, it's just like an airtight crack, and uh, it's like airtight. Trying to see if it moves. I think I can see it just barely, barely, barely move. You know, I can see it move just barely. I would really like to get tight bond in there, but I don't think tight bond will even go in that crack. It's that tight. It literally is that tight. Water will probably go back in there, but I don't think tight bond's going to follow it back in there very far because it's too tight. If it was, you know, if you could open it where you could actually see it open, but I don't actually see an opening. I just kind of see a slight, slight movement there when I'm flexing it. I don't like to use uh, super glue on something like that, but I don't think anything else is going to penetrate back in there. And I'm not even sure super glue will. I'm going to try with this dropper to just put a little bit of super glue in this crack right here. And I'm talking very little bit to see if I can get it to work back in here a little bit. If I flex it like this. Yep, I can see it moving. That does work. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on there. The super glue, you can tell it's the cracks moving more when you put the super glue on there because it's so thin. You can see it bubbling in and out of the crack. And I'm flexing it back and forth like that to let it suck itself back in the crack. That's the only way it's going to go back in there. You can't you can't use a suction cup with super glue. You can't use, well, you might be able to use air a little bit, but I don't think that would even really work very well on this. Problem with air is it'll make it dry. And I don't really want it to dry yet till I get all this flexed in there. That's probably as good as I'm gonna get it. So I'm gonna wipe off the excess. And now I'm going to try to clamp it. I got clamps on there and when I put the clamps on a little bit more super glue squeezed out so therefore I think it's gonna work pretty well. Do I think it's a perfect glue fix? No, I do not. But I don't think this is so bad that even if I didn't fix it that it would be a real issue. So my point is that you know, having that super glue around the edges and maybe work back in there, a, you know, an eighth of an inch or something like that, that's probably going to be sufficient to hold this. Um, you know, if it breaks later and it breaks a lot, well, then we can fix it better. But right now, I would say this is the best way to go about fixing it. And uh, we'll just have to see, you know, time will tell. This, uh, where this is tore out here and this side hole, I could fill that with just plain filler, but I thought it'd be better to go ahead and fill most of it with solid wood. And so I, I took this little tiny dowel and I long, long tapered it so that it'll fit way back in there. I'm gonna put a little glue on it. As a matter of fact, I think I'll just put the glue down in this hole right from the top. And then I'll just get a little extra glue on the rod itself and then stick it back in that hole work it in there a few times in and out and go in as tight as I can get it and that's about it right there wipe off the extra glue and we'll saw that off flush and that should work out just fine so that'll That'll take care of that. We'll dye that brown and nobody will see that. And then we'll fill on top of here too to level it back out and dye that brown.
<clears throat> I've started putting the frets back in here and I thought I had the camera on and I was just using this block with leather on here to hammer them in but as I get up here the neck is so sl slick you know it's it's got such a curve to it and it's short so I can't really get from here to here and that's a long ways uh, you know without some s additional support so I went in and I had a 2x4 and I just took and uh, you know cut this exact deal here that matches and supports it back under here pretty good. What I'm going to do then is I'll put towels under this part and probably just a cloth over this just to take up any little additional space and I can actually clamp it to this fixture. It'll be much more solid and so therefore I think that's going to work real good and anyway we're going to give that a shot. I've got the instrument clamped to the block. I've got uh, just a little shop towel in there for space. I've doubled it over, doubled it over here. Also, you know, to keep it from scratching, but it, it's really more to take up a little bit of extra space. And it's really solid. Then, then there's a little bit of an air gap under here. So I'm just folding this towel up just to the right amount to just put a little pressure in that spot there. And then, you know, that kind of gives that support too, in addition. Plus, it's sitting on this block of wood. So, I think that's pretty solid. That's about as good as I think I'm going to be able to get it. Obviously, it's loud because you're hammering here, but that's pretty solid there. That felt real good. That's real good. Yeah, that's, that's putting the pressure right where it should be, right here. It's not spreading it out. And the back of this is actually just a hair off the table, so it's not sitting on this at all. So it's all the pressures right here where it should be. Yeah, that's, this support thing is really working out good. You can just feel it's much, much more solid. For those of you who don't know what fret wire looks like, here's a close-up. It's got little diamond shapes embossed into it on both sides, and that little tang gets driven down in the slot. Then the dome on top is all you see, you know, so that's all it is. There you go. We got her done. Now we can uh, flush up these ends to the fretboard and it's all good. So my little block of wood clamped up to that with just a little, you know, uh, paper towel basically spacer in between there was perfect. It just worked perfect. So I would recommend that if you ha are in a si similar situation to just make yourself a little block of wood. You drill the holes in there so you can clamp it to the neck. Just in case you have an interest of how I made that block to hold this neck, uh, literally I just you know laid this flat on the 2x4, traced around it with a pencil, just that simple. Then I just sawed it out with a bandsaw. Of course you could use a scroll saw or, or you know jigsaw or something like that. But I used my bandsaw and cuts it out pretty well. Then I matched the two pieces up, held it up to the light like this, and wherever I could not see light, that means it was touching there. So I would sand a little bit there with my uh, belt sander or whatever, or uh, in this case, actually, I used my disc sander. And I would sand a little bit off. It doesn't take much. And then, then you would look and see, you know, where you can see light. Wherever you can see light, obviously, it's not touching. That means it's touching somewhere else, holding it up there. So I would sand a little more off, you know, and until I got all of it where it was pretty close. It didn't have to be perfect, but it was pretty close. And then I put my paper towels on there to take up the space, clamped it there. Everything was perfect. I paused the video for a second so I can put some tape on here. I, this this side here especially, 
uh, stuck out a little bit further. The uh, clines, while well, they look like they cut flush, they don't. They leave, they leave it sticking out, and so there's a lot more filing on this side. And it's, it's really close up here, so I thought rather than take the risk, I just put the tape on there. That'll help. And I still don't want to touch it if I can, because you can cut through the tape in just a second with this stuff. That'll probably do for now. Um, we'll do some more when we do some leveling and sanding and stuff. Now I'm going to go ahead and lightly level all the frets. And, you know, after you drive them in there, and yeah, they're pretty good, but they're not perfect. Before I even do that, though, there's a couple that I can see the ends are not holding tight. So I'm going to put a drop of super glue, hold those down in there, and, and, and get those ends tight. There's just a few of them up here in this area. I don't think the rest of them are a problem. The rest of them seem fine. A lot of guys don't like using the accelerator with the super glue. Mainly, I think, because it turns everything white. I found a trick to this that I think works most of the time. We'll, we'll, we'll try it here. What you do is you put, it on, you put your super glue on. You give it a few seconds to uh, kind of set up. Then you spritz it. If you give it a little time before you spritz it, it doesn't seem to turn things white. Didn't seem like it held it that time either. I need something better to hold that with. This round thing's not doing the job. We're going to put another drop on this one. And let it soak in there. Wipe off the excess. Give it a few seconds here before we spritz it. The one thing I like about super glue, uh, one of the best properties, is it's one of the few glues that sticks to itself even better than it sticks to anything else. So if it doesn't glue the first time, you can try it again, you know, and it works sometimes better the second time or even better the third time. Okay, so we got super glue in that crack there. On this end, we'll press her into place, give it a few seconds before we spritz it. seems to be holding fine and again it didn't turn white or anything which is you know I I think that's the reason is is because I'm giving it time to for the glue to set up just a little bit before you spritz it now I'm looking down the fretboard to see if I see any obvious high ones and I do right here this and it looked like it was high this one here is a little bit high so I'm gonna put my brace back under here and see if we can't just tap that one in a little bit more yeah and this one here it looks like it's a little high now this one I'm gonna have to get my have to get the uh, other block well I didn't have the camera on again I did go back to my little block here with the towel and everything and I did knock in the ends just tapped in the ends of a couple of frets just that looked high I was looking down the fingerboard and I could see a couple that looked a little bit high so I just tapped them in using that block again now I'm just gonna lightly touch up all the frets on top because no matter how good you think you do it and driving them in you never get them in within a thousandth of an inch and this helps get it that way I don't see any real obvious problems at this point. I'm going to work on the corners again. The corners are sharp. Okay, the ends still feel a little bad, but not terrible. I think they're going to, that's going to come out with this. So we're going to round those, we're going to concentrate on rounding those off a lot as we recrown the frets.
And if it's not tearing your sandpaper on the ends like that, right on this outer edge here, then you know you're not, they're not too jagged. That's really nice now. Yeah, that fretboard hasn't been that nice in a long time. Okay, now we can uh, clean up the fretboard one more time before we stain it and oil it. I think we're just going to go ahead and stain it now and uh, make it look better. Once again, I've got my dark brown Feebing's leather dye, and we're just going to, uh, this stuff runs like crazy, so you want to start in the middle and work your way out to the edges. I'm not worried about the pearl. It'll wipe off the pearl pretty good. The reason I'm using the dark brown rather than black is because it is rosewood. So I just kind of want it to look like rosewood when we're done. Once you get it on there, you can just kind of wipe it off. Well, that looks a whole lot better. It is nowhere near perfect, but it's getting much better. I'm not even going to worry about it a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and let it rub on down into the neck area here because we had to sand this area to get rid of some of the scarring in this area. And then I'm just going to try to blend it by rubbing it out here. Looks pretty good really. And we'll have to touch up the whites again. Those white areas, they don't like to stain very well. So they will, they will hold the stain after it dries, I think. Well, that's not too bad. You know, it's like I always say, you always want it to be a little better. But it's uh, pretty good, really. Compared to where we started, which was totally unplayable, completely 100% unplayable, to a very decent looking instrument now, the dots themselves are a tiny bit yellowed now, but that's, to me, about just about right, because that makes it look old, you know, and it, we don't want it to look like brand new. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on this top that I don't know if I should get into or not. It's kind of messed up. The customer doesn't seem to care too much about that part of it. But I thought at least I could address some of the minor cosmetic issues, make them look a little better. These places where it's really light, uh, really, you know, we can darken those up. I think right around here I could probably use this dark dye and get away with it, but in these other places I may have to lighten the dye up quite a bit. Didn't, you know, it doesn't make it look perfect, but it does darken it up enough that it doesn't stand out as much. You know, it's, that's all I'm going for in this case. Because like I said, he doesn't much care that we work on the body too much. He just wants it playable, basically, is really all he wants. But it doesn't hurt to just take a few seconds and touch up a little bit of these spots. Looks like these were holes where they had something stuck on there probably the pickup that was drilled in here too or something that's pretty decent i don't think i'm going to go too much further than that i think this peg head up here uh you know it's it's in pretty darn good shape but i think we can make it look almost like new again not new but you know really well cared for i think the semi-chrome polish will fix that so i think i'm going to take this cover off Here's another one uh, that uh, will surprise surprise you too. It uh, it looks to be painted over, enameled over, or something. I don't know. You can tell it hasn't been adjusted since whenever it was sprayed or polished or something. It's pretty bad. I'm not gonna worry about that right now though. 
So let's take a close up of the peg head before and after. And the lighting once again is the key thing. So there's a before shot before we do anything and it doesn't look terrible it looks pretty decent but I think we can make this look a lot better after we buff it out with the semi-chrome polish here I've got my <coughs> paper towel wetted down just a little bit and it doesn't take much of this stuff at all as a matter of fact I got a little bit more than I really needed for the one spot I'm just gonna dab it around just to spread it around before I start polishing Okay, that knocked off a lot of it. We're gonna put a little bit more polish on, go over it lightly again. Well, it feels a lot slicker. It, well, I hope that shows up on camera because that's a lot, lot, lot better. But yeah, that's so much nicer. It just looks really nice now. So since we did that good with the semi-chrome polish, Let's uh, just take a little Renaissance wax and cap it off. Yo, that's beautiful now. That really looks nice. Hey, that's going to help set off the mandolin a little bit there after we get her back together. You know, keep in mind we're going to be putting new tuning keys on it and everything. I don't know what the semi-chrome will do to that, but why not try it? If it doesn't work well, we can always turn it over. Just put it on here for stability. Put just a tiny dab on here, won't take much. This thing is really dull. That almost looks like brand new plastic now. So that's good. Now we got that fixed. The screws back in there, just so we don't lose the parts. We may have to take that off again later and adjust the truss rod, but right now I'm not gonna deal with that. I think we've done all the damage we can do to this thing until we get our new tuning keys. So we'll put it on the shelf and work on something else for a while. Something I didn't look at close enough when this mandolin came in was how bad these this bridge foot is. It doesn't even sort of match up to the top as you can see. It's only riding on the outer points. This is the bridge that came with it. So, you know, it looks like a brand new bridge. I really don't want to deal with that. I mean, I could cut it down plus it's got the gold. It's got gold instead of nickel which would match this. So, you know all the work that that would take to make this right I think I'm just going to get a new bridge for it and this uh, nut up here now it's plastic and it's junk really and uh, it's way too high now so I think I'm just going to make a new nut out of antler for this also <clears throat> I cut a piece of uh, deer antler to fit this and uh, I've also worked the ends so that you can't feel it on the ends there with this little file and stuff and so it's ready to uh, be put in there. First thing I'm going to do though is clean off the face of this just to make sure that it's making good contact right on the end of the fretboard. Um, it's, it's got a little glue and junk on there so you can just scrape that off with this chisel. Almost always there'll be something there and this one had actually quite a bit. Set it on there, take a look at it, see if it looks like it's sitting flat. It looks pretty good. I'm going to take, double check that the bottom of my saddle's even flat here and just sand it flat real quick just to make sure. It was saw cut flat, but that doesn't mean it's real perfectly flat. So. That works good, yeah. Now that looks like a real tight fit everywhere. It's still quite tall, I can tell. I'm going to, before I get it in there, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and knock it down a little bit more in the vise. 
Not very much more, but just a little bit. It looks, looks pretty nice. Should go on there and make a real nice. Typically, I just use a drop of super glue on this. Just one little drop right in the middle. The trick with super glue is just to get one drop because most of the time you get more than that. That was good. That was perfect. And I'm just lining it up to make sure it's going to sit good and tight there. That should work good. Now we're just on hold till we get the new bridge. Been waiting on the bridge to come in so I could finish up this mandolin. As I was getting ready to put the bridge, fit it to the top, I started noticing there's a lot of buildup here. And I can take my little uh, tool and literally pick that off of here. It's, it's flaking off. And I'm just going to flake off this stuff that they've added on here that's sticking up high. It's... You know, like right here, there's a big ball of it, and uh, just going to see what it'll do if it'll pick that up. If I can get under the edge of it, it just lifts it right up and right off of there. Some of it picks right up. I picked up four or five pieces off camera. When you know when I get the camera going, it doesn't look like it wants to work. Might be a different substance than the other stuff I was picking off. This doesn't want to lift off like that. Here's some more down here. Don't know if it'll pick up or not. Yeah, that's picking up. But then again, I don't know if that's making it look better down there. Yeah, it is. It's getting rid of the bumps. There's just big bumps. Of, it's almost like somebody tried to refinish it and left a big run or something. Just big lumps like that. And so if I can lift off those lumps to just level out the finish a little bit, that makes it look better. Fella's not too concerned about the looks, but on the other hand, you know, if we can clean it up a little bit without doing a, taking a lot of effort, there's no point in not doing that. There's a big old chunk that just came off. Plus, getting that smooth right there where the bridge goes is good because that way the bridge will sit better. Yeah, I'm not sure why these big lumps aren't coming off. They might be a different material. It's a, it is a pretty big bump of stuff there. There it is. I, I got under it there, and now it's popping off. Yeah, I don't know why that was piled on there like it is. I don't even know. It might just be a glue of some sort rather than a finish. Yeah, I got the majority of that off as far as the big lumps go. There's some kind of sticky junk on it right here. I guess that's it as far as what I can do on that. I think I'm just going to go ahead and set up a deer antler saddle for it. I think it'll really give it a lot of punch and make it sound good. Like a nice one here, so we'll just put, put that on there. Fits on there just perfect. And the, the cool thing about these saddles that I get, or bridges that I get from Stumac, is I like the way they're made, and they... Uh, they generally fit the top pretty good on most instruments, and this one fits pretty darn good already. It's, it's a little bit off right here on the end, but not bad. So what I'm going to do is just put this on here and get it in the approximate location. And turn it around. Let me make sure that it fits good that way. Actually, it fits better that way, So and that's the way it should go with the way the saddle's on there. So, you can see there that it was taking a pretty good cut off of the bridge. It looks really good, actually. As far as I can tell, that looks just fine. We're gonna go with that for now. Uh, I'm gonna mark it before I get things turned around here that this is the treble side and this is the bass side. That way I can take this off, cut the uh, string grooves in here. I 
I still haven't cut the string grooves in up here yet, so I'm going to rough them in with the saw. I've already marked them. Okay, so let's see what we got in the way of strings to put on this thing. I just started putting the first string on here and everything's done well as, as well as I know how to do it. But unfortunately, these tuning keys turn backwards for this mandolin. Yes, you could flip this one over here and this one over here and then they would turn the right way. But then the holes don't line up and then the, the places where, this, where the old tuning keys sat don't line up and so it just it has to go this way in order for everything to line up and look right sadly they turn backwards so you have to turn them the opposite way there's a lot there's a lot of mandolins like that these days they've cheapened out their processes on making tuners these days and uh, because of that they don't make them with the reverse gearing so it is what it is. I'm going to leave it that way. It's going to tune backwards, but like I said, it's not uncommon anymore. So I just wished it turned the other other direction. So the customer might not like that. And I don't hardly blame him exactly, but I've I've even built mandolins where they turn backwards. So it just is what it is. You know, once you get used to it, it's not a big deal, but it's just the idea of it. I got the strings on it, got it up to pitch, and uh, it's got a little bit more underbow in it than I would like to see to keep the strings this low, uh, because when that underbow gets in there and you push here, well then that's lower here than it is here, and it, and it, and it is rattling. So uh, we're gonna have to uh, see if we can straighten that uh, neck a little bit with the truss rod, and so we're gonna try that first. Well, we got this thing finally all set up. I did a lot of work on it off camera, uh, adjusting the nut, adjusting the action, even had to re-level some of the frets and, you know, tightening up the truss rod and just a million different little things that just in back and forth and back and forth and raising the bridge and just, you know, to just get it just right. And I'm happy to say it's pretty darn close to perfect. Um, it holds the pick at the seventh fret, no problem. And uh, it's the intonation's real good on it now. And I don't hear any buzzing, and it's got a nice clear sound. So let's play it a little bit, see what it does. short neck mandolin again. Um, if you don't know what I mean by that, the uh, 12th fret is at the body joint here where the uh, 15th fret is the normal body joint for the longer F style mandolins and things. And you can get A models with the uh, 15th uh, joint also. So this is a short neck is what we refer to it as. So it gets a little tougher to get down into the bottom area. Mandolin's got a real nice sound. Real mellow, clear. I'm going to try to play uh, Maiden's Prayer, but instead of playing it out of A, which brings me down the neck further, I'm going to play it in G and just see if I can get through it. This is not a tune that I normally play, and uh, who knows how it'll turn out, but we'll give it a shot.
well, that's a little bit of it, and quite a few mistakes in that, but at least to give you an idea of what the mandolin sounds like, it's got a real nice tone. mandolin here back up in real good shape. I would say that may have been the worst fretboard I ever saw come in the shop in terms of could we salvage it or not and I think we did a good job salvaging it and uh, I think the customer should be real happy with it the way it plays and sounds. Thank you very much for watching my friends. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. Give me a thumbs up if you would please. Thanks for watching.